Good morning, and I hope you had a pleasant swim on the way to church. Oh, and that was yesterday. Incredible amount of rain. But we are here to worship God, and, and that is wonderful. That We are privileged to gather together. Before we begin our service, I want to share a few announcements with you. There is tea and coffee after the church today, so if you'd like to go downstairs for that time of fellowship, please do. Patty this weekend is in Saanich. The Synod of BC is meeting. Started Friday night and ends after worship sometime today. So a prayer for her as she finishes Synod and safe travel on the way home together with all the ministers and elders who are there from around the province. A couple of announcements I want to share with you. Uh, we're looking for a little bit more help once a month at Greystone Manor for singing. If you like to sing, Greystone could use you. That's been 11 to 11.30 on the first Friday of the month. An important meeting this week for people on the board session and for the ushers. There will be a building evacuation training event on Tuesday at 10.30 to 11. Mark, the expert, will be leading us in this. What happens if there's an emergency? How do we get out of here safely? There's also, amongst the other announcements, a note that if any of you would be interested in becoming members of this congregation, please speak to Patty. Now, we're approaching our 75th anniversary, and I'd like to share with you a few highlights of the way God has called us to serve others in the past and the present. Patty has prepared this summary for me. The pandemic was a dividing line for the world. There's before, during, and after COVID. It changed our ministry, but not our mission. God continues to give us gifts for ministry of service. Our congregation shows its mission heart by putting some of our mission, missions right into the budget. Mercy Touch, Caribou House Church, Women Care, and Salvation Army. These are all line items in our annual budget. In addition, we support the PWS Giving Tree in Advent, host a monthly soup and sandwich luncheon, in which many people come to that, support migrant workers, read to and feed children at Glenwood School, and pre-COVID carol, carol to share our faith and love of Christ Christmas. With the outbreak of COVID, some of these ministries stopped while others began. We recorded the services on Fridays, first in a private and empty living room, then in the sanctuary, and once we were back in the sanctuary, we recorded the service on Sunday morning slide. Special music was recorded and our coffee hours became Zoom coffee hours. We missed the celebration of communion, so in the summer we gathered around the Lord's Supper in our parking lot. We were glad to stop using those COVID cups. After COVID, we took up a new relationship with Golden Ears United and began hosting a monthly community meal at their kitchen. We're now feeding 90 people plus once a month. There are two teams, one for the kitchen, one on site, serving and cleaning up. We no longer are conducting worship services at Bailey House. That has been moved. We're doing so at Greystone Manor. Our work with refugees continues despite the pandemic. And as of today, four of our five original refugees are in Canada, and we continue to work to bring Terber and her daughter Merkeb to Canada. As we celebrate our 75th anniversary, we keep our eyes peeled and our ears open for what God might be saying to us at this stage. We have come to worship God. As we prepare to do so, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer.
Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Thanks be to God. Our unison call to worship is on the screen. Oh, give and thanks and give praise to the Lord. Lord. Proclaim Please his name. Make, make known, known among, among the nations, nations what, what he has he done. Sing, sing to him. Sing, sing praise, praise to him. Tell of all his, his wonderful words. acts. Glory Lord, in his holy Lord. name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. To the praise of God, let us join in singing to God be the glory, great things he has done. strength and hope of our life. We praise you for the gift of each day in which we can have meaningful relationship with you, your beautiful world, and with one another. Some of our days are relaxing, invigorating, and enjoyable. Others are hectic, depressing, and painful. But you are with us all of our days, filling us with both joy and with strength for the hour of need. You are the source of our hope as you call us into our tomorrows. We do not know what lies ahead of us, but we know you are there and will be with us. Accept our praise and adoration in our worship this day. And Lord, sometimes we struggle with decisions. Sometimes we are confused, not knowing which course to take. We ask two things. First, we ask for your guidance. Help us to remember that to receive your guidance, we need to faithfully lay before you our concerns. Then, Lord, we ask your forgiveness 
For the times we have blundered our way through issues, made wrong decisions, disobeyed your revealed will, and harmed others in the process. Forgive our impetuousness, our carelessness, and our impatience. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. Christ, when we face ourselves, when we face our great God, we are confronted not only with our need, but the grace of God in extending to us forgiveness. So in the name of Jesus Christ, thanks be to him, we are a forgiven people. Amen. Let us join again in the praise of God as we sing beneath the cross of Jesus and shout to the Lord.
that is so very obvious is that we are all different in terms of our gifts and abilities and interests. I can do some things and some things I can't do. Same with you. And the neat thing in the church is that we come as a group of gifted people to use those gifts collectively for Jesus Christ in his church. Now, <clears throat> we look at ourselves as individuals. We see something of what gifts we have or have not. So I made a couple of lists. I said, I can cook a good dinner, but not a gourmet one. I can fix and maintain many things around my house, but just talk to my son, because when he comes down, Steve, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you help me there, please? Because I can't do it. Sometimes I know how to do it, but I haven't got the oomph to do it anymore. I can no longer climb ladders, and I will never, ever again get on a roof. I can use my computer and cell phone, but my wife has the skills I don't. I do not have an artistic eye, again, like my wife has. I can no longer carry or lift a heavy load. And in our recent move, one of the things that has led us to that is that yes, I can still care for a house and a yard, but not acreage. So God has led us in that. So I have some gifts and some stuff I can't use, do. But how about you and the church? What can you do? Well, again, a list. You can provide a ride for people needing a ride to church. You can lead a study group. You could keep your eyes open and welcome newcomers on a Sunday morning. You could serve on a committee. You could help serve coffee and tea after church once a week. You could help set up and clean up for various events. You could keep in touch with people who no longer are able to come to church by telephone or visit. You can read the scriptures at our worship services. Lots of things that we do, and nobody can do them all, but there are things you can do. And as we look today, we are following Jesus on a journey together, and we're called to use these, our many gifts, in the service of Jesus the Christ. So as we come to consider his word, let us first of all come in prayer. Lord our God, you have given to us the richness of the printed page. So as we turn to the scriptures now, we pray that you would guide and direct our thoughts, lead us to the message you want us to hear this day, knowing that each one of us will hear what you say differently because we are all uniquely followers of Jesus. Thank you. Amen. The response of Psalm is 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. 
His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. With the and the of the Lord, shout for joy before the Lord, the Let the sea resound and everything in it, in the world, and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness, and the peoples with equity. Jesus cl clearly told his disciples that ahead of him was the horror of the cross. Not understanding his words, James and John asked Jesus to give them positions of leadership and power. Christ rejected this and instead told them their position was to serve others, not to be served. Our scripture today is Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then G James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink? or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. Know anybody like that? It seems to me if we look at scripture, one person certainly would fall under that category, and he was Job. Job had experienced tremendous devastation. His children all died. He lost his wealth, and he lost his health. It was commonly believed in those days that that kind of disaster, a series of disasters, came to a person because of their sin. Therefore, he had friends come to him and urge him to repent because of the things that had happened to him. He'd done something very wrong. But Job believed he had done nothing whatsoever to warrant his sorry estate. So certainly was he of his own righteousness that he wanted to contend with God, to have a debate with God, convinced that God would agree with him. While his mind was made up, he never got the chance to debate with God. Instead, we find Job was confronted by God, who challenged him. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I erred, laid earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked out its dimensions? Surely you know. And this was the beginning of a long poem in which Job heard the grandeur of the Creator God. And the more this revelation came, the smaller Job became in his own eyes. He was faced with the wonders of the Creator, and ultimately bowed before the infinite worth 
and power of his awesome God. He was overwhelmed with the majesty of God and centered on his own <coughs> lowly estate. So today, what does it mean for us to be here in the presence of our awesome God? And we haven't assembled here today because it's a nice place to meet our friends. Neither have we come simply to support our church family. We don't come here to be spectators of a religious presentation. We haven't come here to enjoy the music or hear what the preacher has to say. We have come here to worship God. And what does it mean to worship? The word root concept is to bow before, to pay homage to, <coughs> revere and serve that which is deemed of great worth and value. So we gather week by week on Sunday to worship our God, offering to him our praise and our thanksgiving, confessing our sins, offering to him our gifts, our love, our loyalty. We are not the audience in a religious presentation. God is the audience. All that we do is offered to God. We offer to him the joy in our hearts, the gifts of our music, our various abilities, our money, our preaching, our adoration, our praise. We gather each week to worship God. And as such, we are followers on the way with Christ, a people on a lifelong journey with Jesus. Now, for three years, Jesus lived in very close association with 12 men whom he called his disciples. These were ordinary men, much like we are ordinary people. They had their hang-ups, their imperfections, and their strengths. Our reading from Mark this morning was immediately preceded by the third time Jesus had predicted that he was going to be betrayed, tried, abused, killed, and that he would rise again from the dead. The first time he said this to them, Peter pulled him aside and said, Jesus, stop topping this foolishness. That's not going to happen. The second time, the disciples didn't understand what Jesus meant, and interestingly, soon thereafter, began to debate among themselves about which one of them was the greatest. And this third time, James and John simply turned away from what they did not understand, but came to Jesus and asked for him a favor. They saw him as the, the coming Messiah King, and they requested that he grant them the privilege of being his second in command. We want to sit one on your left and one on your right. They were jockeying for position. We sometimes see this politically, when, for example, a politician will switch parties with the hope of being re-elected or of getting a cabinet position. Here is political opportunism, a jockeying for position and power. That's exactly what James and John were doing. They were jockeying for power. Jesus' response was, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said there were, understanding it to be a, a cup of, of blessing and a baptism of joy as, as Christ. But a cup can also be a cup of, cup of bitterness, as recorded, for example, by Isaiah regarding the faithless Israelites in their exile on Babylon. He said, stand up, O Jerusalem, you have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. The cup of the cross was anything but joyful. We can also think that baptism by fire sometimes is very difficult. That's the kind of thing Jesus was referring to. Yes, they would drink a bitter and tough cup. They would be baptized with the fire of persecution. But he was not about to grant them their wish for political power. Instead, he taught them a different way, and that was the way of servitude. Jesus pointed out that so frequently in the world, people who struggle for power and achieve it, often in the end, rule harshly and selfishly. 
And Jesus said, this shall not be so among you. Whoever wishes to become great must be your servant. As the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life for the ransom for many. Jesus taught his disciples that they were to serve one another as they journeyed together as the followers of Christ. Each of them had their strengths and their weaknesses. Each followed Jesus imperfectly, but they were a team seeking to help one another along the way. I think that can be said of us as well. Each one of us has our strengths and our weaknesses. Each one of us follow Jesus imperfectly, but together we are a team holding one another up in the worship and joy of serving God. You have been called to be a follower on the way, and this implies moving into the uncertainty of tomorrow, because we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring in any sense. But we do that in the confidence that Jesus is ahead of us, calling us forward. So being a Christian is not a matter of adhering to some doctrinal statements or attending classes or knowing texts and concepts. A Christian is simply one who is on the way with Jesus, seeking to follow him day in and day out. Now some have been Christians for a long time, and on that journey with Jesus they have learned much. Some have been on the journey with Jesus for a long time, but they haven't learned too much, unfortunately. Others are relatively new in the journey, and they have so much ahead of them, so much to learn. But all are Christians. How one becomes a Christian does not matter. For some, their coming to Christ implied a dramatic change in their life. Others, were born into a Christian home and had walked in the shadow of the cross all their life. The important thing is that by the grace of God, you and I have been called by the Holy God, wooing us through his Spirit to follow Jesus. Paul said, <coughs> said on one occasion, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus, forgetting what lies in the past, things that were good and things that were bad. That's yesterday. Today I press on to follow Jesus. Now sometimes in our journey with Jesus we really make a mess of things. And other times in our journey the love of Christ shines through us to others. This, I believe, is why Jesus was so down-to-earth in teaching very practical things to his disciples, things that they needed to know that they might walk the journey wisely. He talked about anger and money and sexuality and forgiveness and justice and love. He taught them these things because they were to follow them, and he taught us the same thing as we today must deal with, anger and money and sexuality and forgiveness and justice and love. How we as Job of old have a glimpse of the holiness and majesty of God. We have been awed by his grandeur, awed so much that we bow before him in worship and praise. As you look at any group of Christians with their strengths and weaknesses, each one is called by God warts and all, to follow Jesus. Now, sometimes some of us have a problem accepting ourselves. We might think, in comparison to that person, what have I got? I can't do anything that's of much great value. Others are so much better than I am. I haven't got much to contribute at all. Down on me. Let me tell you the story of a young minister of our church who had a battle within himself for 10 years, a battle of pride and a battle of inadequacy. 
In the context of his own congregation, he often felt that he was doing a pretty good job. The people were responsive, and he could certainly conduct a nice wedding, and he's pretty good at funerals too. But, when he rubbed shoulders with his colleagues at Presbytery or Synod or General Assembly, he saw himself as very inferior in his knowledge of scripture, of doctrine. He found himself as being a very slow thinker, not good in debate, not quick on his feet. He found himself to be a very inadequate minister. And then he went home again. This oscillation between pride and inadequacy troubled him for 10 years. Finally, he shared this with his session, and one of his elders brought him the peace of self-acceptance. The elder taught him that God had given him certain gifts and abilities, and that his task was to use those to the best of his ability to the glory of God. God had given different tasks and abilities to other ministers, and their responsibility for God was to use those gifts to the best of their ability. That minister came to accept himself as God's person who was on his way with following Jesus. And by the way, I was that person. Each one of us today has a glimpse of the majesty and holiness and greatness of our God. We've been called to be on a journey with Jesus. None of us do this perfectly. Each of us, collectively and individually, have gifts and abilities and interests, and we're called to use them in the service of Christ. So the word of the Lord for us today is a question. It's not, what do you believe? But rather, are you striving to follow Jesus? An old hymn puts it this way, Lead me, Jesus, I will follow all along the way, down the dusty pathways, all along the sea. Teach me, Jesus, to be loving. Your disciple I will be. Lord God, you call us to be your servants. You have gifted each one of us so that all of us have things to contribute to your church, to your work. Help us to be increasingly faithful as we walk that journey with Jesus. Amen. And so we sing together, brother, sister, let me serve you. Pilgrims on a journey and compassion.
As part of our response to God's grace given to us, we present to him our morning offering. Please remain seated as we sing together. gifted by you and gifted for you. Take, we pray, our multitude of different gifts. Use them to your praise and glory in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So let us turn now and offer our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession to our God. Today the words of an old chorus come to mind. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. And so, Lord, today we thank you for the gift of our personal lives, of being alive, and this in the context of our personal families and friends. Thank you for calling us to be the followers of Jesus and welcoming us into your church so that we are not Christians in isolation. Thank you for the blessings we receive as Canadians, for such things as health care, education, freedom to assemble for worship, and many social services. Thank you for the blessings of political freedom to select our government leaders and to change that leadership. So, these last few days, Lord, we've gone to the polls to elect a new legislature in our province. And normally when that is over on election night, we know what's happened. But this time there's still no clear winner. And whatever the outcome is, some of us will be pleased and some of us will wish otherwise. But our prayer, Lord, is that for those who take office, to have the responsibility of leading this province. We pray for wisdom and stability, for the desire to serve, not to be served. Together with our government leaders, we remember those this week who have been richly blessed, those who now face serious concerns for their health, their personal well-being, financial security, unemployment, hopelessness, or the fear of uncertainty tomorrow. All these are prayers we ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us when we pray to use these words. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May the mind of Christ, my Savior, be our song. <clears throat> Oh, 
journey with Jesus. All of us are gifted in so many different ways. Let us strive to use those gifts to the glory of God. And as we do so, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and for the rest of your lives here on earth. Amen. Face.